Turn to Revelation chapter 1. You know, John, the Apostle John, while he lived uh, in, I should say, uh, as, as a younger man in the Gospels, you know, he was one of the 12 apostles. And uh, man, those guys walked and talked with Jesus. They were with him 24-7. Now the Lord would send them out on preaching tours and, and healing tours. And yet uh, what you're impressed with in the Gospels is how much time they spent with him. It says this about the Lord that he called these men that they might be with him. And so for three and a half years, the Lord Jesus Christ poured his life into them. And um, you had the 12, and then you had an inner circle. You had Peter, James, and John. One man said this, it's not because the Lord played favorites, because the Lord doesn't. He is no respecter of persons. But they made the Lord their favorite. You know, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. And so Peter, James, and John were the inner circle. And yet, it appears that John was even closer than the other two. Um, you find expressions of how John leaned on Jesus' breast. And um, so there was a closeness there. When all the other disciples were looking at each other uh, that evening of the Last Supper, and the Lord had just said, um, one of you shall betray me. They were going around the room saying, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And it says, Peter looked over at John and beckoned to him and said, ask him who it is. And John didn't say, is it I? John said, Lord, who is it? Because he knew it wasn't him. John was on a whole different level with the Lord Jesus Christ than any of the others. John knew the Lord Jesus very intimately. How would you ever forget those days? How would you ever forget what he looked like and the sound of his voice and his expressions and his reactions and hearing him pray and hearing him preach? How would you ever forget? And yet when John sees him in Revelation 1, he knows it's the Lord. But he looks different. Look, Revelation 1 Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. It's, it's a joy to be here this morning. It's a joy to sing these songs. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, Lord, uh, please help us in this next little bit of time we have together. And Lord, make it really count for thy name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there were some, uh, there were some good things um, in the church at Ephesus. We talked about that last week. But there was an invisible quality. There was a thing that had been lost. And, um, and the Lord said it had been left. Uh, maybe they didn't even realize it. And the problem was not a sin problem, as with some of the other churches. There were sin problems in some of the other churches. But he doesn't mention anything about that to Ephesus. There was no stealing going on. There was no lying. There was no gossip. There was no envy. There was no secret evil. There were some really good things there. But can you believe it? The thing that was missing was an emotion, a feeling. And the Lord said, I don't like what's missing. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. He, somewhat, it wasn't a total write-off, but he said, but there is something wrong here. He says, because thou hast left thy first love. You know, when, when the heart is right, as a believer, when the heart is right and everything is clear, when we walk in the light as he is in the light, there is some feeling and emotion. Would you look at a few verses with me? Keep your place in Revelation, but go to the book of Psalms with me for a moment. You know, we, we tend, uh, especially as, as Baptists, you know, we, we tend to downplay emotions and feelings. And, um, and, you know, we have our reasons for doing that. But, you know, you know how we are. Human nature is react, reactionary. You know, we, we see some groups that have run off the deep end. We've seen some groups that have emotion at the expense of truth. We see some people that just ride on their emotions, and if the emotions aren't there, they disappear. We see all that, and, and there is a tendency. You know, we, we're always trying to encourage people, you know, to, to go on every day, you know, whether you feel like it or not, and that's a good thing. You know, we know that not every day is the same. Um, we know that everybody's emotional makeup isn't the same. You know, that's a given. But the Lord looked down at Ephesus, and He says, I'm grieved because he said the emotional side of your Christianity is gone. He said, you're still serving me. But he said, but man, you're not feeling it. Look at Psalm 71. We read these verses, um, and I don't know how you guys are, but, you know, often we read Things. We read chapters, you know, many of you are reading through the Bible and using some of the charts. And man, that's a great thing because a lot of people never, ever do that in their whole life. And, uh, and, and man, what a, what a book the Bible is. But, um, but sometimes it's good, you know, just every once in a while. Sometimes a verse will jump off the page at you. Many of you, you understand what that's like. You're reading and all of a sudden this verse, it just like jumps off at you. And when that happens, it'd really be a good thing to think about it. Look at Psalm 71, verse 23. David said, My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul, which thou hast redeemed. Can we read that again? My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. You know the word rejoice. Do you know what that is? Um, uh, you know... Um, we, we all have different ideas about that, but the word rejoice by dictionary definition is an emotion. And the word in the old dictionary is the word exhilarating. I mean, it, it is a, it's a feeling. And the Lord said through David, remember the Holy Ghost authored these words, my lips shall greatly rejoice, David said. Look at Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. And, and uh, th there's a colon there. The, the, a colon always says, pay attention to what follows. You know, people would, uh, would differ over the, the uh, definition of, of rejoice, you know, and everybody's got their own little spin. And that's half our problem is, is a lot of times we put our own little spin on things we read. But the Lord is always careful to keep reading. He's always careful to define his terms. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Now, I don't know about you and some of the religious groups you grew up in, but I, I know Baptists really, really well. And, um, you know, um, there's a, there's a small group of Baptists that really believe this verse and they're, they've learned to really rejoice in the Lord and they're really outcast by the rest of the Baptists. And, um, you know, most Baptists, um, they are very calm and dignified and, uh, and they're that way by design. They pride themselves. You know, they don't want to get carried away and they actually frown on anybody getting too excited. And, um, and when they read this verse, this is probably how they read it. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, 
And shout for joy when the song leader tells you to shout at that one word in the chorus of the song. You ever seen it? Um, I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. And the song leader goes, praise God! And everybody jumps in, and that's the only time they shout, and there's no joy involved, and everybody sort of smiles sort of self-consciously. I'm just here to tell you, we do that, and we want to encourage it. But that's total nonsense. It's not nonsense to encourage it, but it's nonsense when that's what you're satisfied with. Look at Psalm chapter 5. Brother Gip will be here. Brother Gip's the first one I ever heard say this, and I really appreciated it. Um, some of you are very outgoing and boisterous, and, and I'm just going to throw in my little disclaimer here. I realize not everybody's the same emotionally, so I don't want you to think that I am trying to create something. Boy, that's another mistake that preachers and Baptists are famous for. You know, people, they, they try to press people to respond. It's okay to encourage it. But it's another thing when you're trying to manufacture it. So we're not trying to do that this morning. Everybody's different. Some people are very excitable, and some people are pretty low-key. And so one person can be shouting the praises of God, and somebody over here, they're just as happy, but their happiness comes out their eyes in tears. And so, and one person's got tears, and another person is laughing for joy. And so, there, so you know, the, the point is not, it's, it's, we're not trying to manufacture a stereotypical, let's all do it, let's all be cookie cutters. No, God made us all different. But He didn't make you without feelings. And He intended that what He did for you would elicit a joyous response, however, whatever form that takes. He looked at Ephesus and He says, man, He says, you guys have, you've lost You've lost something that I intended to be a part of your Christianity. Look at Psalm 5. Psalm 5. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice, colon. Let them ever shout for joy. In other words, let it never stop. Because thou defendest them, you're conscious of what he's doing for you. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Man, he's beating that drum. That's three phrases back to back. I started to say this. Brother Gip said, uh, he said, you know, a lot of people are self-conscious and they really feel that joy. Um, and, um, but they have a hard time expressing it because they feel a little inhibited. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we... They're not inhibited at other times, but they are in church, and that's just the way it is. Um, but he said, maybe what you should do, maybe what you should do is practice. He said, you should go into your closet and shut the door and take your pillow with you. And just go in there in your closet and put the pillow up to your mouth and go, praise the Lord. And he says, that way the sound of your own voice won't scare you too much. And he said, practice that, practice that. And he said, well, then eventually you'll get comfortable where you can take the pillow away. And you're still in your closet, but you can say, praise the Lord. And then you can say it a little louder. And after you get used to that, you can come out of your closet and say it in the bedroom. Look at Psalm 63. I heard a preacher many years ago, a really, really neat guy. And he was talking about when he got saved. And he said, I hadn't been saved real long. And... Um, he said, I was going to this church and they were singing. And he said, the people were singing some of the great songs that we sing. And he said, I felt something just welling up in me. And he said, I felt like I was about to pop. And he said, but I looked around and everybody around me just looked pretty straight faced. And he said, I, so he said, I, he said, I could feel it. It was going bloop, 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 bloop. And he said, I just shut it down. And we sang another verse and I felt it coming up again. He said, after a while, I learned it was okay to let it out. Amen. Psalm 63, Psalm 63. 
Verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips. Not, not just your heart. Thank the Lord. You can praise him quietly, man. You really can. But he said, my lips shall praise thee. Verse 4. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Some of you see people raise their hands, and that's a bit of an oddity to you. And you think, where do we get that? Well, actually, there's several places it turns up in the Bible, but this is one of them. Thus will I bless thee. This blesses the Lord. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. But notice the next verse. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. What an amazing thing. Here he's saying, you even do it at home. When it's just you and God, where only he can see. The problem with Ephesus wasn't that it was missing for a day or for a week. You know, not every day is the same. Man, we have some trouble days. We have some, we have some heavy days. We have some days, you know, that you don't feel good, all that stuff. But that's not the problem. When the Lord looked down at Ephesus, the problem was not that it was missing for a day or a week, but that it was missing altogether. And that they had gotten used to that. And they figured that this new dead Christianity of theirs was normal. Love is an emotion by definition. Thou hast left thy first love. Love is an action. Love is an action. But it is an emotion. Love is an experience. It's not just a nod of the head. You know, you know, you got all these Christians and God have mercy. We are, we are, you know, sometimes I think we've gotten so far from uh, you know, in, in 2024, we've gotten so far, far from what real Christianity ought to be that, um, that, that people, they've gotten this bizarre idea that as long as you nod your head and agree that, that it's okay. But love is an experience. Love is not a nod of the head. Love is not a contract. Love is not logic. Love is not quoting a scripture text. Love is an experience. Love creates an attachment. Love of the right kind says, I'm all in. Love is an affection that captivates. It motivates. It causes joyful action or it causes defensive action. You know, it happens every year. A few years ago, there was a lady and her husband and they were walking through the mountains and, um, you know, and, and uh, middle, middle-aged couple, and, um, and of course, you know, you know, and, and, and I understand this, I'm not going to get off on that, but you're, but you're not allowed to carry weapons there. And so, you know, you, you hope, you hope the glorified bug spray does the trick, you know, and, uh, here come a grizzly, here come a grizzly and the grizzly attacked her husband and started mauling him. We sure appreciate you ladies. You know what she did? Her love kicked in. The only weapon she had was her purse. And she went to work on that grizzly. I mean, she was slamming her purse, and it probably weighed several pounds. And she was smashing him on the nose for all she was worth. And after, you know, 45 seconds of that, the grizzly said, I've had enough. And he walked off and she saved her husband's life. You know what? You know what? You know what her love was? Her love was an experience. She didn't go, I love you, honey. <laughs> I wish you the best. <laughs> That's what a lot of people's Christianity is. I love you, Lord. <laughs> I got things to do. I wish you the best. No. 
No. That's not what he calls love. That might be what you call it. That might be what you were trained. You know, it's just this blase thing that never really amounts to much. It just causes you to agree at the right moment. God says, oh, no. Oh, no. He says, I don't accept that. You got to remember, he's the author of love. For God so loved the world. Love is an experience. Love is an emotion. Love causes joyful action. Love creates smiles and automatic responses. You know, I, I hesitate to use the example, but it's very fitting. But you know, um, you know, you see people when they're when they're when they really love each other. And I know, you know, you, you know, there's moments where everybody gets on everybody's nerves. I get that. But you know what? When people love each other, you ever watch people interact and you can tell, hey, you can tell when two people like each other, let alone love. You know, if you ever watch somebody treat somebody and you can tell, you walk away if you've got any power of observation at all, which most of you do. You watch an interaction, you go, boy, that was a little chilly. Oh, it was just a vibe. It was just a little body language. Or you say, man, those two, they really like each other. Love pushes other interests away. Love crowds out things. Love takes the front seat. Love is consuming. Song of Solomon says it has a most vehement flame. Love is not a sideline. It is not blasé. It is not sleepy. It is not casual. But when love falls back into the dust somewhere, you know what you get? You get activity without affection. You know, you get a, you get a, a married couple and, and the love flame starts to fade. You know what? They still do a lot of the same things, but <clears throat> you can sense the affection is fading. The Lord said, set your affection on things above, not your activity. Boy, it's funny how we read into this. We think, boy, as long as we're cranking out some activity and we're doing the right things and I got a few things on the ball, I'm okay. And the Lord said, no. He didn't say set your activity. He said, set your affection on things above. Boy, when love gets left in the dust, things become mechanical. And the lights go out. And you get duty without feeling. You get duty without delight. You're probably still there in Psalms. Look at a couple verses with me. Look at Psalm 40. But when love is there, the duty becomes a delight. But when it fades... You get duty. I mean, there's some people, they've got enough character. Uh, that was the old school. The old school, you know, you'd have these people, they stayed married for 60 years, you know, and the love had died about five years in, but they were they were so charactered, man, they were going to make it work. Man, we're, we're way past that now. That doesn't exist anymore for the most part. But, you know, there is the odd person. They've got enough character just to, just to, just to make her happen, and, um, and they're doing their duties. But there's no delight. There's no delight. Look at Psalm 40, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And we could look at several verses. In Song of Solomon, you find these words. Song of Solomon is that love, Song of Solomon is that love story, and we're going to look at a few verses there in a moment. But here's what she says about the man she loves. She said, I sat under his shadow with great delight. She said, just when his shadow hit me, she said, that was delightful. You know what that is? That's love. Have you ever read the Bible love stories? You remember reading about Jacob? You know, Jacob, uh, Jacob comes along and to his... Uh, 
to Laban's household and, and uh, he meets Rachel. And uh, man, he, it, it is love at first sight when he sees Rachel. And um, man, he is, he is ready to sell his whole life for her. And uh, so he makes an agreement with the dad. And this is, this is back in those days. And all you young people will say, praise the Lord, we don't live back then. And uh, he made an agreement. The agreement was, the agreement was, I will work seven years for your daughter, Rachel. I'll work seven years. And Laban said, okay. So he worked seven years. Can you imagine, guys, seven years? Wow. That's a long time. That's depressing. Like, really? But you know what? Love, love said, I'll, I'll do that. But you guys know the story. Laban was a trickster. And Jacob was about to reap what he had sowed because Jacob all his life had cheated people out of things. And so now the chickens come home to roost. It is one of those laws of God that you just can't escape. And man, it was reaping time. And it's his honeymoon night. And, you know, I don't understand all their customs. Um, I, I just, um, you know, you read the story and you wonder how can this be. But had, had we seen it, we would totally understand. But boy, the wedding night comes. And uh, in, in the darkness, there must have been darkness. And there must have been enough of a similar look about the two gals that Laban slipped Leah into the wedding tent instead of Rachel. He wakes up in the morning to Leah. And the Bible says very nicely, but the Bible says Leah was not attractive. And he goes to his father-in-law and he says, what have you done? It was too late now. And so he makes another arrangement. He says, you work seven more years. Are you kidding? Seven more years. And you can have Rachel. And Jacob loved Rachel. He figured, well, if I got to wait seven more years and I got to work for seven more years, I'll do it. You know, one of the things you see about love there, it sure was an experience. It sure created an attachment. It sure wasn't mechanical. And he felt it deeply. Go to Song of Solomon. You're <coughs> in Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then Song of Solomon. Now, don't worry. Some of you are going to get a little nervous, and I'm going to be discreet. <coughs> You have to, you'd have to be familiar with the book Song of Solomon to understand that. If you've never read it, you ought to go home and read it. It's a wonderful book. Isn't it amazing some of the things that God himself inspired? Hmm. Song of Solomon. I want you to get some context with the book. <coughs> Look at chapter 1, verse 1. <coughs> the Song of Songs, which is... Solomon's. Okay, so that sets the stage of the book. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness? This is, the whole book of Song of Solomon is like a conversation between the woman that's in love and the man that's in love. Of course, the man is Solomon, okay? So you've got this, you've got this conversation going throughout the book. In Song of Solomon 3, verse 6, she's talking, okay? She says, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it. He had 60 armed guards of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. Uh, she had seen this place, and she was. she's talking about it. She's in awe of her lover. Verse 9. King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering it of the of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown, 
wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals, in the day of the gladness of his heart. Go to chapter 8, Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 12. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand. She said, you know, I've got a vineyard, but she says, you've got a thousand. He's the king. And those that keep the fruit thereof, 200. You know, she and Solomon in this book are in love. She is one of Solomon's wives, okay? So with all that said, Go back to chapter 1. People say, you know, this is a book, it's a picture of Christ in the church, and that's true. You know, there, there's some, there's, and, it, and boy, what a, what a picture of marital love and the way it ought to be, the way God intended it to be. It, it's a glorious picture of some of the most intimate things about the marriage relationship. But it also is a reality picture between Solomon and one of his wives. Song of Solomon 1, verse 2, and she says, she says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor, the pleasant smell of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment port port. She said, I love even to hear your name. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. She's talking. Chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. That's a deer. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. He has come to pay her a visit. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one. And come away. He's saying, let's run away together. Man, this just oozes sweetness. I like it. If you're nervous, I hope you get over it. This is good stuff. Verse 11. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds is come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vine with this tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. Now, now he's, um, he's talking to her. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shiner and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine. And the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. And the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. I would say, I would say they are having an experience. Wouldn't you? Boy, it just doesn't sound dry or blase to me. It sounds like, man, there's fireworks going off here. They're having an experience. It's called love. It is God created. It is God ordained. It is Holy Ghost inspired. It was love. And God looks down at Ephesus and he says, you know, guys, he says, you got it on the ball. 
He said, I love your doctrine. He said, I love how you've worked for me. He said, I love everything you've done for me. But he said, but you know what I miss? He said, I miss how you guys used to love me. He said, that's what I miss. This is God talking. You know, we get this hard, cold picture of God. And, and you know, there's some things about God that are just unflexible. But boy, there's some other stuff. It's just good. John Wesley, John Wesley had been asked to preach at a place called Exeter in the uh, in this in the uh, 1700s, and um, he accepted the invitation to come, and uh, he was allowed to use the the pulpit in that church. Uh, apparently, it was a fairly large church, and he was allowed to use their pulpit both morning and afternoon. So he preached at this church, and the text that he preached on was this. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Wesley was famous for this sermon. Wesley had a few sermons that he would preach. you got to remember, he traveled all over those British Isles for, for you know, over 40 years. He traveled and preached and traveled and preached. And, and so as he would go from place to place, there were certain messages he would preach over and again. He had one he preached on the new birth that he preached all over the British Isles. And this one also he preached on righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He preached that in the morning message. And um, uh, the, the minister came up to him after the sermon and said, Mr. Wesley, you must not preach in the afternoon. He said, I know I told you you could preach in the afternoon, but he said, but I've changed my mind. He said, not that you preach any false doctrine. He said, I would have to admit that what you said is true. But, uh, but, you know, you're going to lead people into extremes of enthusiasm. That was the word they used back then. Enthusiasm meant fanaticism, emotionalism, you know, getting carried away. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, occasionally somebody in our services will raise their hand. Somebody will shout. Sometimes people will really shout and somebody, will, and somebody will, one of these people that are just, you know, prim and proper. Well, you know, I, I really don't think all that's necessary. You know, it's, it's a little extreme. They're over the top. That's just the flesh. That's the way this guy was. And he was a little ticked because John Wesley preached on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and, uh, and John Wesley said, he said, I walked away scratching my head. And he said, I thought, what was it about that message that bothered him? And then he said, then it dawned on me. He said, back in those days, many of those churches were very formal and they believed that real Christianity, really, you could boil it down to three things. One was being a really nice guy and not offending anybody. The other one was just make sure you're in church and at the Lord's Supper all the time. And the other was giving alms to the poor people. And they believed that if you did those three things, that that was Christianity. And, and John Wesley realized, he said, oh, my soul, that's what happened. He said, I got up. And he said, I preached that you could do all those three things and be dead as a hammer and not have any real Christianity. He said, in fact, as I had been preaching, he said, I began to insist that every follower of Christ should expect and pray for the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, that they should be rejoicing in hope of the glory of God, that the love of God should be shed abroad in their heart. And he said, I was hammering on heart religion and experiencing it with their heart. And he said, they believed that that was emotionalism. On another occasion, John Wesley was writing and he was reading a book. And um, in one of the books he read, there was a, quote, letter against fanaticism. And he said, as I read the article, he said the guy was, he was a clergyman. He was, he was writing against, you know, anything joyful and happy and, and un, you know, he's, and um, he said, I realized, he said, the more I read it, that he, he seemed to, uh, he seemed to think even the people that wrote the Bible, he said, by his rules, even Jesus and the apostles would be fanatics. And he said, the very thing that he called fanaticism is nothing other than real heart religion. In other words, and I quote, righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, John Wesley said, these must be felt 
or they have no meaning. He said, all who condemn the inward feelings, and he said, he said, I'm not talking about extremists, okay? But he said, but all that condemn those inward feelings, they leave no place for joy or peace or love in religion. And so this is what they do. They reduce it to a dry, dead carcass. Boy, did you ever be in a church like that? I grew up in a bunch of them. And as a little boy... I grew to hate it. Some people like it. You know what? You know why they like it dead? Because they're dead. And it makes them look bad when somebody's getting happy about Jesus Christ. The Lord looked at Ephesus and he says, guys. He says, you got so many things on the ball, but you've left the emotion and the feeling way back there somewhere. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2. You're in Song of Solomon probably. And then Isaiah and then Jeremiah chapter 2. You know what the, you know what the, the devil doesn't want? He, he, do, he doesn't want you happy. He doesn't want you happy. He doesn't want you happy in the Lord. He doesn't mind if you believe the right stuff. Now, he'll make war on that because that causes him grief too. But if he can just get you happy with believing the right things and resting self-righteously and believing the right things and just sort of being dead and dry, but you believe the right things, he'll, he'll, he'll settle for that. But what he doesn't like is when somebody learns that they can rejoice in the Lord round the clock. He doesn't like that because we live in a world of misery and in a world where there's no peace and in a world where people are disillusioned and de disappointed and depressed. And when they see somebody that's happy, they, they wonder, could I be like that? And they're drawn to that. You've heard me tell it. Brother Colson, about an hour south of here in Lacombe, he's the, uh, the pastor emeritus there of that church. And uh, Brother Colson would often be out and about in town. And, um, and uh, he said he would be at the till. And you know how people are. And we all do this. And it's, it's just sort of a, a pleasantry of our society. But we really don't mean it. You know, well, how are you doing? And he says, oh, you know, his house could have burned down yesterday and, and somebody could have killed all his cats. And he would say, fine. And he's not doing fine. You know, he, he's really sad. You know, but, and, and, and then he'll, he'll return the question, how are you doing? And I say, fine. You know, I might have just lost everything yesterday, but I'm fine. And, um, but Brother Colson started doing this. You know, people, he would ask him, how are you doing? And they'd say, fine. And then they would say to him, how are you? And he would say, I'm happy. He said, without fail. And when he said it, he meant it. And it was written on his countenance. He said, without fail, every time, they'd be right in the middle of a transaction. At the till, people behind you. They would stop and say, why are you happy? Do you understand why the devil doesn't want people happy? He doesn't want you happy. If, if he can keep you miserable, he'll let you believe the right things. It's got to be more than doctrine. It's got to be more. Look at Jeremiah 2, verse 1. Jeremiah 2, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. And all, oh, what does the Lord say to them? Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. The Lord says, I remember, Israel. I remember when you loved me. I remember. Would you go back to Re Revelation real quick? Almost done. Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Verse 4, he says to Ephesus, nevertheless, in spite of all your goodness, and he says, you've got lots, and the Lord was sincere. 
He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Verse 5, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Remember. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. And you ought to go home and t today or one night this week, uh, read Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, it tells the story of the birth of the church of Ephesus. And man, that was the place where that horrible, filthy temple, the temple of Diana was there. And uh, it, was, it was known as the center for that horrible, idolatrous worship. And everybody worshipped Diana. And man, a church was born. And man, that church became a powerful light for God in that part of Asia. And um, the word of the Lord actually spread throughout all Asia because of what was going on in Ephesus. And the Lord says, Ephesus, remember, remember, remember how you got saved out of that darkness and out of that temple of worship of my Diana. Remember where I found you. Remember how glad you were. Remember how you told others. Remember how excited you were. He said, remember that first love, which raises a question. Do you remember when God saved you? You know, I got looking at this and I saw the word remember and I thought, wow, for a lot of people, the question to ask is, is there something to remember? You got something to remember? You know, that, that day of salvation... You know, you, you remember, you know, about where you were and you remember the time of the year. You might not remember the calendar date, but boy, you remember and you remember the process. Do you remember? Do you remember the conviction? The conviction? Nobody's saved without conviction. You don't talk somebody into salvation. That's why you got to be real careful when you're dealing with kids. Uh, kids are good and pure and sweet and innocent and they love to please. And, uh, and you say, but oh, pastor, they won't get saved. Oh, sure they will. Just let the Lord do his work. Keep coming. Keep letting them hear the preaching. Read your Bible to them at home. Leave the doors of conversation open. They'll come. But you let the Lord do the drawing. You say, is that in the Bible? Yeah. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches, and it says, and they were pricked in their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what do we do now? Man, the Holy Ghost had nailed their heart and they ask, what do we do? Do you remember that? Do you remember the conviction? Do you remember when you'd hear about salvation and hell and heaven and your heart would pound and, man, you had visions of hell and, and uh, maybe you grabbed the pew, but you searched your heart and you wanted peace? Do you remember how, how sweet it was when you heard about Jesus on the cross? Do you remember how He had died for your sins? He took your sins in His body on the tree. God was satisfied with His blood and He would save you forever because of what Jesus did. And Jesus was buried and three days later He got up from the dead. You remember that? Remember how that, that message, it began to mean something to you. And do you remember when you took that step? Man, you might have been at home. You might have been in your car. You might have been in church. But you finally came to that place and you, you called on His name and you believed and you chose Him. You came the best way you knew how, remember? Remember? You remember the relief? I remember the relief. The peace. The burden lifted. The fear of death and hell gone forever. And it would never come back again. Do you remember? You say, well, preacher, that was your experience. No, I'm sorry. If you don't understand what I'm saying... I don't care what you did. I don't care how many times you prayed. You don't know the Lord. Do you remember? Oh, everybody in Ephesus remembered coming to the lay remembered. They remembered what a difference He made in their life. Do you remember the joy? You remember the joy? Remember how happy you were? Two times in Acts chapter 8, Philip is preaching and... and, and um, and again, please hear me. I'm not stereotyping everybody's going to swing from the chandeliers and, and shout so loud your neighbors hear you. I'm not saying that. But in Samaria, Philip goes down and preaches and people start getting saved by the droves and the Holy Ghost makes a comment. There was great joy 
in that city. And then at the end of the chapter, the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. And it says, he went on his way rejoicing. Do you remember that? One guy said this, you may not shout, but if you're right with God, you won't mind if somebody else does. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember that zeal? You got saved and you wanted to tell somebody. Do you remember? Do you remember? Mm. You might have been pretty timid about it, but you wanted to tell somebody. Do you remember? Some folks have gotten used to their salvation and they've gotten too far from that day and they've left it way back there somewhere and they've left their first love. Do you remember? I remember when my burdens rolled away. I had carried them for years, night and day. When I sought the blessed Lord and I took him at his word, then at once all my burdens rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. I am happy since my burdens rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. I am happy since my burdens rolled away. Do you remember? Do you remember? The Lord says, Ephesus, you're a good bunch. I think the Lord looks down at us and I think, you know, we're not what we want to be, but we're trying, aren't we? We're, we're, doing, we're, we're working on it. I think the Lord would look down at a bunch of us and he would say, you know what? I sure appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the stand you've taken. I appreciate you believing the right things. I appreciate you reading your Bible. I appreciate that. But the Lord says, but in the midst of all that, why don't you keep going back and just remember what I did for you? As long as you live, don't ever forget what I did for you. Because someday it's all going to be even more real than you can imagine. Remember. And don't be afraid to feel and rejoice. Don't let somebody rain on that parade. Don't let somebody stop the well of your joy. The Lord says, I'm looking for the right doctrine, but I'm looking for somebody that loves me and feels it and is glad to feel it. Lord said, I'm looking for that too. Let's pray. You know, you're allowed to rejoice and you're allowed to feel it. You got to push all those negative thoughts out of your head. I think the devil tries to fill our heads with that. You know why? He, he doesn't want you to go back and remember. And the God that saved you is still with you. Lord, bless your truth. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you as a piano plays, why don't you talk to Him? Man, the Lord intended this thing between you and Him. It'd be real, and there'd be some real feeling to it too. How long has it been since you felt it? Maybe it was yesterday, and if so, you can praise His name. But if it's been a long time, why don't you come and talk to him about it? Because he wants you to feel it.